Okay, in this lecture, we're going to talk about recognition. So remember, what we're talking about here is a form of episodic memory. And uh, what we're talking about is if you see some people, objects, pictures, whatever it is, and then we're showing you some previously encountered objects intermixed with a bunch of new items, and your job is to tell us which ones are old and which ones are new. So recognition is, do you recognize it or not? Is it old or new? Sometimes people confuse this with recall. Now remember, recall is when you learn a list of information and then there are no cues, there's no presentation to you, you're just recalling it out of memory. So here we're just focused on recognition. Can you remember uh, old from new sorts of things? So we have a couple of definitions. So not only just the definition of, oops, not only the definition of recognition itself, but we have a couple definitions within recognition. So the first thing is when we're considering sort of how do we recognize, and that's the general context here is we're going to talk about how do we actually make the simple memory judgment. The first thing is to understand is that we have what we're calling the memory trace. And this is whatever information gets stored in memory. That's the memory trace. And then what we do is we have that memory trace activated and then we evaluate it. We evaluate it using what's called a decision criterion. This is the rule to make any sort of memory decision. Now I'm going to make it a little bit clearer when I talk about signal detection theory here in a minute, in a minute um, what this decision criterion is. Okay, but we have the trace and then we're sort of evaluating it. Now a couple other definitions to keep in mind or to learn is uh, we can have items that we studied before, old items. These are studied items. And we have items that are new, unstudied items, on our memory test. Now remember, our, our job here is to tell the researcher which items are old and which items are new. So we can make a response, either old or new. Now in some cases, this is going to be an accurate judgment. So if you're presented an old item and you call it old, that's an accurate judgment, and that's what we call a hit. So it's a hit, and really the language is stilted towards identifying old items from new items. So you sort of see the language is sort of, you know, work that way with that frame of reference in mind. We could have an old item, but fail to identify it, in which case we're calling it new. In that case, that's a miss. We fail to detect that old item. We could have new items, and if we call them new, well, that's another correct response, hence the name correct here, but we call that a correct rejection, again, the terminology can get a little confusing here, but we're rejecting the item as being old. So it's new, a correct rejection though, okay? We could also have a new item and we call it old and that's what we call a false alarm, right? So a false alarm in this case is accidentally saying a new item is old. It's also something that is often referred to as a false memory, which we'll, we'll get into. But not all false alarms are necessary, necessarily uh, false memories. It could just be a simple error. Okay, so bearing this terminology in mind, what we're going to do in this uh, lecture is talk about two models, two clearly dominant models that describe how we make recognition judgments. And we're still sorting out these models, still gathering evidence to sort of delineate between them, still modifying these models. But I'm going to go over sort of the basics of, of uh, both of them, and then we'll talk about how they're different and all that kind of good stuff. So the first one is this signal detection theory. So signal detection theory is a nice theory because it can be applied to really any binary decision. So anytime you have two options to choose from. So in this case, we have the options old or new. So we have two options. It's a binary decision. And there's some ambiguity in that decision, right? So there's some signal. So there's old items that you studied that were old, but you also have these new items. And it's not always clear which category they fit in. So uh, in other words, there's some ambiguity in this decision. In that case, we can apply sort of a signal detection theory in the sense that what you're trying to do is you're trying to detect signal, in this case, an old item from all of the noise that's sort of in the system, right? So this can be applied to recognition, signal detection theory can, but it's also been applied to all kinds of behaviors that are binary judgments. So for example, in radiology. So radiologists have to look at uh, x-ray images or images of whatever kind and try to detect 
which images show evidence of like cancer and which ones are normal. So in that case, they're trying to detect cancer from among normal cells. So they're trying to detect that, detect that signal from amongst other information. You can also talk about this in engineering when you're building a device. So for example, like a smoke alarm. The smoke alarm is detecting signal, but it's detecting smoke in the air from amongst other air particles, right? So uh, in this case, the uh, device is sampling over and over again and uh, evaluating the quality of the air to detect whether or not there's a fire or not. So signal detection theory can be applied to anything. It's one of the reasons I talk about it in this class because I think you can see instances in a lot of other fields where this is valuable and, inf and informative. And so it's good to sort of talk about it here in terms of recognition. So there's a couple pieces uh, to signal detection theory, two components. One is, remember, the memory trace itself, the strength of the trace. So under signal detection theory, the idea is that we have memory strength, and that's going to be plotted here along the x-axis. This is what's sort of, in this diagram, referred to as evidence. But here we're talking about memory strength. You could have weak memories, and you could have stronger memories, right? Uh, and... Uh, the idea is that the old item distribution, as you can sort of see here, is going to be on average a little bit stronger in memory strength, so a little bit to the right compared to the new item distribution. Now the other thing is um, this version of signal detection assumes that both uh, the old and the new item distributions are what we call normal or Gaussian distributions and that they're equal. That's not always the case, and we could get deep into the weeds in this, but the idea is that the in this depiction, both the distributions are, are equal. So what that means, to translate, what that means is that you have, on average, these old items form this Gaussian distribution here, this normal distribution of old items. So some old items are really strong in memory strength for whatever reason. Maybe these are words that made you think of uh, important events in your life, right? Like, so a word that maybe made you think of your mother, that might be really strong. But then you also have old items that, for whatever reason, idiosyncratic reasons, are weak. And so they're sort of down here. But collectively, they form this theoretical distribution, which has sort of this average value here uh, and is normally distributed around that average. The same is true for the new items. You have this sort of average value, and you have some variability in it. For whatever reason, some of the new items might be a little bit stronger. Maybe they bear some similarity to some of the items that were studied on the list. And maybe these other new items that are down here and that are weaker don't bear any similarity to the items uh, on the list. In any event, they form this sort of average distribution, which is lower on this memory strength x-axis uh, continuum here. Right. So that's the idea. Now, the center of these distributions can be estimated based on uh, individual scores and their performance, and we can calculate a measure distance between these two distributions, and that's called D prime. So D prime sort of measures the strength of the memory, right? So the stronger your memories, the further apart these distributions would be, the further to the right these distributions would be, and we'll get into that here in just a second. But let me sort of explain. So then you also have a criterion. Remember I mentioned that you ha have a criterion by which you're going to evaluate the memory strength. So you have your trace strength and you're going to evaluate it relative to like this criterion. And it's just sort of plopped here. It can vary from person to person. It can vary from situation to situation. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit. But the idea here is this is the line at which when your item, your test item, is beyond or to the right of this criterion, you're gonna call it old. So if you're following along here and making some notes, just put a little arrow to the right. Anything that falls above this criterion, you're gonna call it old. And anything that falls below this criterion, you're gonna call it new. So this is like your decision rule, if you will. When it, the strength is to the right of that line, you're gonna call it old. When the strength is below that line, that's not enough strength evidence to say that it's old, so you're gonna call it new. So that means that this line carves up a couple uh, regions uh, on these distributions. So to the right of this line, and if it belongs to this old item distribution, well, that's a hit. That's an old item called old, so that would be a hit. This other portion of this curve here, this belongs, and this is where it gets a little difficult because this is a three-dimensional drawing shown to you in two dimensions. 
But this tail down here that you can sort of see here, it's bounded, it's to the left of our criterion line, but it belongs to this old item distribution. So these are old items, but they fall to the left of the line. They would be called nude, new, so those are misses, right? So those are misses. Now we have the same thing over here with the new item distribution. So here to the left of the line, they belong to the new items, so those are correct rejections. So the CR, is, CR stands for correct rejections. And then you have a group of new items. They belong in this little tail right here but they fall to the right of our criterion. So this would be new items called old or false alarms. FA is false alarms. So that maps onto those boxes that we just saw, but now you can sort of see it in uh, regions, theoretical distribution regions, right? So that's the idea. And so if you were to, and you could calculate this for any person or for any situation, any recognition situation. And so the idea here is, is that if you, um, and you can calculate measures. So you can calculate a D prime is actual. There's a formula. You don't have to learn the formula, but there's a formula to calculate D prime. There's several measures of D prime that can be estimated. And um, as you have stronger memories, for example, let's let's think for, for a second. We, we know from our prior lectures that you can create weak memories by shallow processing. So if you had shallow processing, these two distributions, these old and new item distributions are gonna be much closer together. My mouse is not working, there we go closer together um, than uh, uh, if you had shallow if you had shallow encoding. Now if you had deeper encoding, what's going to happen is this old item distribution is going to get further pushed out to the right because it's a stronger memory. On average, the strength is much greater. and so those two distributions would come further apart. The old item the new item distribution would stay uh, put, but the old item distribution would move further to the right and our D prime value would get much larger. Also, keeping in line with that, if you had shallow encoding, this false alarm region might be greater, right? Because your distributions are closer together. And with deeper encoding, this false alarm region is gonna shrink. It's gonna be much smaller, right? That's the idea. You'd have fewer errors, right? Now, the same thing is true for the criterion. You can measure criterion by uh, a measure that's called C, C for criterion. That's pretty simple, right? And the criterion can shift. Remember, everything to the right of this is gonna be called old, everything to the left of this is gonna be called new. It can shift, it can shift on an individual whim. Uh, some people might be more liberal, and that means more old responses, so that would mean that their criterion might move to the left here. So they have would have more hits if they were more liberal, but they would also have more false alarms because they're calling more new items old as well. It also can be more liberal with uh, age, with Alzheimer's disease, traumatic brain injury can influence criterion, and also instructions can influence criterion. For example, we could ask participants, what if, what if we instructed them, hey, call it old if it has the slightest chance of being old? Then most likely they would have more old responses and they'd have a more liberal criterion. Or if we gave them money for points and we gave more points to hits, well, then they would sort of want to maximize their hits. So they would call more things old and have a more liberal criterion. So what would happen is the criterion would shift left and our C values would get more negative because they're moving to the left. So that indicates that it's a more liberal criterion. Now, obviously we can shift the criterion to the right and be more conservative. Remember all the language is stilted with respect to old. So conservative with respect to old, that means there's fewer old responses overall if, it, if the line moved to the right. So we could do this by saying, giving instructions to participants saying, say to them like, call it old only if you're certain that it's old or if you gave them more points for correct rejections. So they might weight it, weight their responses to uh, respect more correct rejections that would move this criterion to the right and make it more positive, right? So that's the gist of signal detection theory. Now there's another uh, handout that I'll have in Canvas that you can read that'll provide you another explanation of this uh, theory, give you a little more detail. But I just wanna sort of give you some evidence for this. So like, just to re refresh what I was saying, like if you have deeper encoding and you can calculate D prime, what you find is D prime values go up as a matter of fact and also the criterion won't move, so they stay the same. 
Uh, also, we can manipulate criterion by instructions, for example. <clears throat> and what will happen is the D prime won't change, but the C value will change, showing that just the criterion moved around, but the strength of the memory signal did not. So I have an example of this in a study that we did in 2007. We had two conditions, one conservative, liberal, and we gave them instructions like call it old only if you're absolutely sure in the conservative condition. In the liberal condition, we told them to call it old if it had the slightest chance of being old. As you can see, our D, these are the hits and the false alarm uh, proportions here. But the D prime didn't change between our conditions, but the C did, right? It was the, so they're moving their criterion around and changing the hits and false alarms, right? So lots of studies like this modeling recognition, successfully modeling recognition with uh, signal detection theory. It's definitely one of the most um, influential kinds of models still today in recognition. Now in the other video, in part two, I'm gonna talk about the other option here, which is a dual process model of recognition.